So um, I'm really pleased to welcome Avi Bernstein here. Um, Avi is full professor in the Department of Informatics at the University of Zurich and head of the Dynamic and Distributed Information Systems Research Group. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you got it right. Um, so I first came across Avi's research group, I think, in 2005, when, um, and many times since when I realized that it was always um, I was always at any of in the bar with his PhD students. Uh, <laughs> 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 Pretty vice versa, actually. <laughs> but I, as well as being good drinkers, I quickly realized that I really put in research. <laughs> <laughs> Coupling really great technical stuff with really rigorous evaluation, I think it's one of the hallmarks of your group. So um, then it's all about processing large graphs. Who will be speaking today, so really interested to see what you think. Okay. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, originally, uh, Tom had asked me to talk about processing large graphs, and in our conversations, it came out more and more into, why don't you tell me what you guys do? So if this is going to be, and you're not your usual research talk, uh, but more like, uh, you probably not have been to Disney World, right? So this is not a Disney World kind of crowd. Anyway, there, there. So my analogy won't work. So just, just think. Going to Madame Tussauds to know all your, uh, uh, all your uh, people you need to know. Um, this is the uh, equivalent to the Madame Tussauds show. So I will not show the evaluations, but if you have questions, I will gladly show you the graphs and so forth to, to back up the statements. What I'm going to try and do is give you just kind of a survey of the kinds of things that we do. It's going to be slightly quickly, but I'm sure that you guys will be able to uh, get along. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really sure I need to make this argument at all, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and do it anyhow. There is a whole bunch of data out there that is graphs and not tables and not arrays. Um, uh, I guess you guys know about RDF data more than I do, maybe. Uh, but there's some other data out there that is graphs, too, so let me just show you something. This is actually a phone network, a cell phone network in Graz and people making phone calls to each other. And this is kind of the towers, the connection from the towers and the people moving back and forth from the towers. Uh, this is the uh, you know smart grid with different people and different sources. It's absolutely unclear to anybody in the market right now whether the smart thing to do, I, I don't know about the UK, but Switzerland just decided to you know get out of uh, nuclear power plants in the next probably 520 years. But anyway, they've decided to do it. Uh, so it's absolutely unclear whether I should put solar panel on my roofs or batteries in my cellar. It's unclear what's actually the better move, because if we do have a smart grid, actually storing might be a more expensive activity for, or more a better activity to give the grids than actually generating. Um, just some other things. Uh, this is a sensor grid of all the uh, uh, radioactivity sensor in Switzerland. Um, it's a very interesting grid because it turns out that the fluctuations there are pretty high, not necessarily because uh, radioactivity goes haywire in Switzerland, even though we're very active, not necessarily radioactive. Uh, but actually, there is quite a bit of radioactivity in the air. And when it rains, you wash down all the dust to ground level, which is where the sensors are. So whenever you, you, you can see the rain time, you know, the, the onset of rain very well on these sensors. Another grid. Uh, sorry, another another network. Well, the internet could be just any other big network, I guess. You wouldn't know the difference anyhow. Then there are, uh, well, this is Facebook. I, you, you may have seen this. This is the connection graph of Facebook. There is certain uh, filtering on the strength of connection, uh, and that's those are all the friends of friends of friends. There is no geographical information. You know, no, nobody drew the outlines of the states here. This is really people living here. Uh, so here is another graph. Um, this is a graph we worked on ourselves. Uh, this is 19, the last half of 1999. Uh, business releases, so press releases, and co-mentioned companies. Uh, when they have co-mentioned more than 20 times, we have a, an edge. Uh, and here you have, right, this is the bubble. This is the midst of the bubble. Uh, where are they? Yahoo, Microsoft, um, IBM. Down here are a couple of airlines, uh, sorry, airline business people, Boeing. Delta, American Airlines, etc. So graphs, 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 graphs. These are biology graphs. Uh, this is some regulatory network of some gene that I don't know anything about. And this is the blow up between even more genes and their interaction. And last but not least, um, you know this. So 
I've always wanted to analyze these things, not build them, not store them, but analyze them. And when uh, we, you know, one of the conferences he just mentioned, when we realized we wanted to analyze these things and we took a standard tool set off the web, uh, you know, Geno, just name your favorite tool set to process these kinds of data, we realized it's aggravatingly slow. Right? We just have to wait for hours and hours to get just the simplest answers of queries. So we realize if we want to actually process all of these graphs, we need to do something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what we do. Uh, and I'm just going to give you an overview first to kind of give you a coat hanger to know where we are in the talk. Um, the areas we work on is semantic web on the other, one side and, and machine learning on the other side. And that's where our project cluster around. So let me just start off. This is kind of the order I'm going to go through the project. We have one project, which is kind of machine learning on graphs, uh, where we deal with the financial institution on fraud. So we do fraud detection on graphs that change over time. Um, we have a big investment in triple stores. How do you store a number, large number of triples, either in a centralized place, or what if you have multiple triple stores out there and you don't actually know what the stuff is that is, you know, what's on what triple store, but you want to answer a query across all of them. Um, okay, the order is not quite right. We do some stuff on temporal triple stores. What if you have a triple store where certain edges are associated with a timestamp, that the timestamp actually uh, gives you the validity of the edge and you want to have queries that uh, deal with these different validities. We did some stuff on natural language interfaces to uh, uh, triple stores. Uh, we uh, did some stuff on cultural user interfaces, so user interfaces that adapt to the culture of the user. And I'm placing this here in the middle because we use a lot of knowledge engineered ontology stuff as well as machine learning to do to make this happen. And I'll just show you some different interfaces. Then we do some more machine learning -y stuff where we use background information to actually improve the machine learning process. Then we do some machine learning stuff that has nothing to do with triples whatsoever, but in analysis of chemical compounds in NMR spectrometers, those are nucle nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers. I'm not going to talk about that. No worries, no chemistry here. And I forgot here, uh, we have a distributed processing framework for a large graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk around here and kind of end up somewhere here, uh, walk you through these projects for a quick thing. So as a motivation, a practical graph that's large. Large is uh, millions and millions, even billions of edges, which is take your standard bank, the standard transactions over time, money flowing from one account to another. And what you want to find in there is fraudulent behavior. Let me just show you what fraudulent behavior might be. Uh, you want to get money from one account and get it out there. And so what you might do is something called smurfing. So you will take the money from the source account and transfer it through multiple accounts to end up in some target account and then get it out of the bank. It's a standard known technique. So you're essentially obfuscating the money flow by distributing things and getting them back together. You might do this with just one account or you might do this with changing accounts over time, which is what you see over here. And then comes to find you use some other accounts and you can get this in arbitrarily complicated manners. Um, we did this with a financial institution and they stored their graphs in a standard da data warehouse which is underlying relational. Fact is if you want to run a query that will discover patterns like this on the data warehouse you start the queries 20 microseconds later the, your database administrator comes running and says stop. You can't run this because our database goes down. Now again, this is a financial institution. They have quite a lot of money to pay the fastest server and the biggest hardware. It doesn't work. Um, nonetheless, uh, we build systems that essentially emulate this kind of behavior by firing off SQL queries that look at, you know, retrieve one link at a time and then let people browse it on a temporal timeline or graphically and discover, for example, here that this kind of hash of network actually means that all the money flows to one account. And if this is a suspected account, you have something here that's not good. Um, can't tell you much more about this fact as it's being used on a daily basis now within that financial institution. So the real problem is what if such a graph would be stored in a way where it would be retrievable fast? And I guess you have something like that in your platform. So one thing and probably one of the most famous thing we did in that area is uh, a couple of years ago, we were trying to answer your standard queries uh, on on, you know, on a semantic web. So here we have, you know, a fragment of a graph 
Gerrit Weikum, who's a professor at the uh, University of Saarland and uh, at the MPI in Saarbrücken. He teaches a course, which is the information, sorry, information retrieval and data mining course, right? And it's at the university, University of Saarbrücken. And what if we want to run that query? What courses does Gerrit Weikum teach? And at what universities are the courses? So, you know, showing this as a graph pattern is we have Gerrit Weikum. There's a relationship to something else that is teaches, that something else is course, right? There's a question. Um, and then we have the at university. Um, and then it's, and again, question mark university. So what's the best way to answer this query? So when we started with this uh, five years ago, um, we said, we, we don't really want to do this. We want to do the machine learning part on top of it. So we took some off-the-shelf systems and this is the state, or this was the state of them. So this is Jenna answering this query. And these are megabytes of input files. I think this is in the N3 files, right? Um, so, which said, well, th this can't be it, right? 10,000 microseconds. Um, so we took KON2. KON2 was even worse. It crashed here because we got to the two and a half gig limit of, of allocating RAM on a 32-bit machine. Um, then uh, we tried Sesame, and I said, stop. This is not good enough. I took a master student and said, here is everything you always wanted to know in static query optimization. Read it, and I write the static query optimizer for for ARC, for Jenna ARC, which he did, uh, and he came out with this. So this is one, two, three orders of magnitude, right? And either this is a Nobel Prize winner, master student, or uh, something is wrong in Denmark, right? And we know something is very wrong in Denmark. These triple stores don't really, or these triple stores didn't really do what they were supposed to. Now let me show you why, which, you, which is one thing you might know. Um, if you take the way triple stores typically answer this, there are four main ways. I have no idea how you guys work, but this is what was at least that at the time. You do the Jenna way, which is either you dump the whole thing into a relational database, which is what I'm going to call the way to, or you actually load the whole graph into RAM and you do some graph isomorphism. And that's going to be slow. And you're limited by RAM. This is the second way. You take your relational database, you allocate one table with three entries, or four entries if you want to do named graphs. And now you do your queries and you self-join the table to the wazoo. That doesn't scale either because you actually, you know, jump back and forth on the disk if you do joins and you have to do indices. And most relational databases are row stores. So you have a B tree where at the leaves you store the whole row, which is very inefficient because you're getting much more I.O. than you actually need because if you self-join the table, you're usually only interested in two rows. So at VLDB 2007, an alternative approach was presented uh, to store the whole thing in different tables. Uh, and each of the tables would be for a property. Uh, and you would store it in a column store. And the column store idea is essentially that each column is stored separately in a B tree and you use the index to actually find out which the common uh, uh, attributes are. Um, the advantage of this is you can do run length encoding that reduces IO. Uh, and you can, when you join, just take two columns. The disadvantage of this approach is obviously that when you have, if you have an unbound property, you're going to do unions, and unions are bad because you don't have any indices over multiple tables that are in a union, so you have to do runtime processing. Uh, at the same time that we did our work, uh, and that is probably the, the, the last bit of related work, somebody else published a paper, also at VLDB 2008. This is Thomas Neumann and Gerd Weikum. And what they propose is just take every possible combination of subject, predicate, object, and throw it in a B-tree. And in the B-tree, you either store yes, it's there, or no, it's not there. So it's a simple B-tree lookup login uh, to tell you whether something's there or not there, and then you can do the joints rather fast. Uh, and that's what these guys do. So I think they have like 20 different B-trees, 16 different B-trees with all possible combinations of what they do. Uh, it has the advantage that it's updatable, but it's actually not quite as fast as we're going to see afterwards if you have certain things. So what we did is we tried something else. We asked ourselves, so if I have such a query, what is the fastest possible data structure to answer the queries? Uh, and what we came up with is, is essentially a cascade of, of, of hashes. Um, so essentially, everybody does dictionary encoding. That's clear. Um, if you just take the first part of the query, the fastest way to get to a predicate would be just have a hash, look it up, and I'm done. Uh, sorry, a subject. And then we do the same thing for the predicate. So we, we chain a set of hashes here again. Um, 
and have a second level index. And at the third level, we don't do hashes, but we do ordered lists. And it's going to become quite apparent why we do ordered lists in a second. So uh, what you do now, if you want to add a join this way, uh, you can either kind of look up just at university, or you decide to actually take this ordered list and now do lookups again in this in this table, right? So what you can do is you can come back, uh, go to databases, and from the database management system, go back to at university, and you've retrieved your first course for Gerd Weikum, and the second course obviously is down here. So this is relatively straightforward. It gives you amortized order of one plus one plus one for the lookups, and that's linear, and that's beautiful. Uh, it does come back and bite you if you have lots of updates, obviously, uh, because if you update on this caches, eventually you'll have to rehash, and that's painful. I'll talk more about that afterwards. Let me just tell you the last advantage. So here you see a subject predicate object uh, order of things, and that's why the whole thing is hexastore, because we don't do it once. We do it six times in every possible order. And the beauty of this, and there's a reason why I put them in this order, is if you look at the bottom, all of these are paired, if you actually look things up from two sides, you can do the look up this way, and here you get two ordered lists, and that's the fastest possible join, a merge join, because both lists are ordered. And again, you're in linear time. You're not in constant time, but linear time, so that goes really fast. Um, yes, so what are the pluses and minuses of this hexastore approach which we published at VLDB? Uh, concise handling of nulls. There are no nulls. Reduced I.O. No choices possible necessary about indices. What we find empirically is, uh, well, worst case is you get, uh, sorry, let me get to this, pairwise joins or merge joins, reduction of units and joins. The disadvantages, you store things multiple times. At worst case, you have a five times overhead practically. It's about the three times overhead on uh, what you have in practice. And the second thing are updates. So you've been thinking a bit about updates and what we've been doing for updates uh, is something, uh, whoa, oh, it works. Um, what we did is we've combined a hash with a B-tree. Literally, this is your standard B-tree, and here is a hash. And what the hash is going to do, it's going to point at the leaves in your B-tree. And the advantage of this approach is that as long as your data is somewhat stable and you don't have to rehash, you get order of one access to your data. And the moment you're rehashing, you're going to send your queries through the B-tree and you'll have login access. Now, log n can become slow. I don't know about the data sizes you do, but you know, if you have lots of data, and we tend to have much larger key spaces than the relational guys, like log n can become slow and painful. So, so this combination allows us to, assuming few updates, to access things with order of two most of the times, and if not, use the, the, the B-tree access. Okay, so this is just a game thing, right? We, we ported this whole thing to the iPhone a few years ago and participated in the billion triple challenge, put it on the iPhone. I think we got disqualified for only putting a quarter of a billion triple on the iPhone. Uh, and other people were using, uh, you know, blue jean supercomputers to compute some stuff. Um, with a modern iPhone, we could put, this was an eight gig iPhone on a modern iPhone, we could put a billion triples. Okay, enough. So this is the hexastore work on which we built a lot of our extensions. Let me see what I can get here. Okay. Avalanche takes this whole idea to a different place. It essentially says if we take the linked open data cloud seriously, people are just going to publish data sources or Sparkle endpoints. They're not just going to necessarily put out triple files, but actually data endpoints. The question is, how do you query across data sources where you have no knowledge about what's in them? Ex ante. Um, so uh, there are a number of problems. There's a key space problem and a joining, uh, joining data sets problem. And a how do you organize uh, your query problem? What we proposed with Avalanche, uh, we're in Switzerland, so we need to take a moniker like that, right? Is to actually have the query go through the set of data sources like an Avalanche and then have a two-phase approach where at the first phase uh, some server asks the servers, the other servers out there, so some machine asks the, the triple stores out there, do you have anything about this? 
And if yes, give me some statistics about what you have out there. And then at the second stage, it does some planning and we'll try and get back with the first answers as quickly as possible. Uh, rather than trying to show this to you in an image, let me try and, oops, I don't think we need to, this is a movie, oops, where's my mouse? Uh, this is a movie of this um, that shows you. So what we do here, we get a query from the user. It looks around for a host with relevant data. It requests statistics from them. And then it does it, you know, it executes the query in a distributed fashion, meaning it plans the query execution plan. Actually, it continuously plans query execution plans, since you don't know what order is good. And you then send out those query execution plans to the participating servers, and they will, if possible, actually do the joins without sending back into central anymore, assuming certain bandwidth restriction actually make it more efficient to talk them directly with each other. So we have heuristics, sorry, we have estimates on what it is the bandwidth between these machines and what are the probabilities of, of triples showing up and we try and find optimized plans. So we run the plans one by the other in parallel until the first results come in. Uh, and what I can show you at least here is uh, how this will look like. So uh, what you're going to see is the execution of this on five different servers. Um, this is going to look very, very geeky because you're going to see terminal windows, sorry. Um, let's see for this to come. So we have a simple query on DBLP that we divvied up. This is the main server. So it goes out and asks for the statistics. The statistics come back and then the whole thing comes back. So this was way too fast. Now let's do it shorter, uh, slower. Um, let's get through the text. This is part of the demo. Come on. Okay, here we go. Slow motion. Again, the DBLP query. We put in the query here, it asks for the statistics. the statistics. These are the plants now that come out. The plants get sent out, they get partial results. The partial results can go back, they get answered. What we also do is the server will try and do some estimate, you know, looking at the number of results that come back and look at when, you know, when there, when is there some saturation. So it uses some statistical techniques, assuming that you get lots of results in the beginning and then you saturate eventually to use the statistical techniques to break off and then essentially say, okay, we're stopped now. Most probably we have the most important results. Okay, onwards. Another big effort of what we've been doing uh, is this thing uh, where we said, okay, once you have this large graph, maybe you want to do more than just retrieve parts of it. Actually, you want to run algorithms on big graphs. And so you could ask yourselves, what should you do? Um, the first thing is use Sparkle. And no, you don't want to do this because you can't really process. This is really what you do to retrieve parts. The second thing you may want to do is use some custom solution, Jenna, MPI, right? We have, we've heard people uh, doing RDFS reasoning on Blue Gene using uh, message passing interfaces. That requires PhDs to actually code this up. There was a guy in Shanghai this year from the Pacific National Laboratory. I think they process graphs on the Cray. And I talked to him and he said, well, yeah, it's true. We need to take PhDs in computer science and sit them half a year to teach them how to program a Cray efficiently. I don't think everybody wants to do this when they try and do scalable solutions. Um, last but not least, right, the uh, silver bullet these days is Hadoop and MapReduce. Um, the problem there is that you actually have a mismatch between what you're trying to do is process a graph and what you're actually doing is process key value pairs. So whilst there are, for example, reasoners implemented in MapReduce, it's non-intuitive how those have been implemented, right? You have to think very carefully about the RDFS rules and how you can stream things through the rules and, and it works, but it's not intuitive. So we came up with this thing called signal collect where we say, what if we try and do this naturally? So we essentially have two things. Uh, we have signals that go between the nodes and we have collect functions, some processing happening in the nodes. Just to show you RDFS subclass reasoning, just a subclass element as signal collect. So we have vertices, those are the classes. We have edges, uh, which are the subclass relationship. And we initialize the state of each of these vertices with um, the value, sorry, with, with its own class, right? With the edge that it gives. And what we need to do now as a process is a very simple thing. Uh, we need to send down 
a signal, and as an example, we'll just send the signal, what is my own state? So we sent the state down, and now you need to update, you need to do the collect, and to collect is just a union of your own state and the, all the signals that come in, and eventually this thing is going to converge to an RDFS subclass reasoning. So this is relatively clear. So we added to this two more elements. One more element is some notion of prioritization, so you can score signals. And things with a higher score are likely to be executed before things with a lower score. And the second thing is the possibility to run them asynchronously, right? In a parallel environment uh, with multi-cores, you may actually not want to synchronize because synchronization is going to cost you. Now, synchronization is good because it allows you to prove some things and serialize things. But without it, you may actually get algorithms that converge faster. Let me just show you one simple algorithm quickly that converges faster. Let's say we do single source shortest path. That's the usual thing people do to test these kinds of things. This is the synchronized way. So we send signals out. We sorry, we initialize. Uh, we initialize with infinity for everything but the starting node. And what we send along is the state plus a weight. Right. So we did this. So we sent up once out to the immediate neighbors, and everybody else got sent infinities around. Um, we update the states. We send around messages again, um, and again, and we do lots of updating and lots of sending around, lots of unnecessary stuff being sent around, and eventually we need to know that once we've reached the diameter of the graph, we can stop sending around and we convert. If we do this now with a scoring where we say we only send out signals when there's actually a change to the own state, and we don't do it in other cases. Eventually, the, prog the, pro the program will converge and will send out way fewer signals. Uh, let's just look at this. So we send out the ones from the initialized state. We update. Everybody who updates sends around, right? We said, so this is asynchronous. So this guy's going to go first. Uh, then this guy's going to go do the update. Um, now, we are in the final state yet, but the algorithm hasn't realized yet. These two guys are still trying to try and send stuff around. And eventually they'll converge because there is no updates anymore. That's it. We're done. So obviously this is faster and actually asynchronicity will help you for some algorithms to actually converge when if they would run in the synchronized case, they would oscillate. Um, let me just show you some more complex algorithms because this was simple. Um, so this is the RDFS subclass inferencing. I'm sure the movie doesn't see this. I'm sorry. The collect is essentially the union of the incoming states, right? The, 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 um, the single short sort is the shortest path. That's what you saw before. Uh, this is page ranked in two lines. What you essentially do is you take a weighted average of the current state, which is usually 0.15, and then 0.85 times the incoming weight of all the incoming uh, votes. Um, those are just the weights that are usually being used when one uh, does it. Uh, and the signals are uh, your weight divided by the outgoing edges uh, and your, your page rank divided by the number of outgoing edges uh, and eventually you can you converge. Um, just showing you that there is also complicated stuff that you can do this way. This is something called the general sum product algorithm on factor graphs. I don't expect you to understand what that is in detail. Almost all of statistical reasoning on graphs, so relational statistical reasoning, reduces to this. And what it means in terms of signal collect is two collect functions and two signal functions. So if you have a Markov random field, a conditional random field, or any kind of these modern statistical graph techniques, this is it. You've seen, you're seeing the reasoning implemented in terms of four lines of code. Now, just showing you that this is not just Avi is waving his hands at so few lines of code. This is page rank, and I'm going to show you the actual page rank implementation. This is it. So we implemented this whole framework in Scala. Scala is a language that runs in the Java virtual machine, and it combines object-oriented with functional properties. So what you have here, this is the, this is the weighted sum here at 0 0.15 plus 0.85. The set of all the signals fold left. Those of you from Lisp times may remember fold left. So that's essentially take the whole list and apply the operator plus to each of the elements in the list. So this is the sum, and the uh, and the signal is the source state times some weight over the sum of all the weights. 
and that, those are the signals you're sending out. So this is two lines of code. Now, to actually run this on a data set, we need to add some more lines of code. The initialization is always more expensive. Uh, as in this case, what we do here is we have a Sparkle query. We go out to uh, a DBLP in its RDF form. Uh, we look at all the citers, cited combinations in this specific case. Uh, we add a vertex for the citer, a vertex for the cited, then we add the edge, and when we're done with it, we run the execution. And this is essentially it. And if you want to look at some performance figures, I think this is um, a million edges, four million, or about three million, sorry, at three million edges, about a million nodes. Uh, this is uh, uh, just showing you with eight cores, it's essentially a linear speed up when doing uh, page rank. Obviously, there are things that don't speed up linearly. Uh, we're not putting Amdel out of effect here, and right? Amdel's law still applies, but some things essentially speed up almost linearly. Um, just to show you one other thing, so this is synchronized, and this is unsynchronized. And you kind of get a speed up of two on the same algorithm. Okay, next. So another thing we talked about is temporal data. What if your triples are tr true in some elements, sorry, in some periods of time, but not in others. Um, actually, uh, if you think of it, and if you're a software developer, you're essentially getting into the SVN or CVS problem, right? So what do you store and what don't you store? What typically, the, the, the proposed solution these days is we'll just have different name graphs and store the whole names graphs again and again and again. Obviously, that gives you huge storage overheads, right? So the subversion solution to this thing is to just store the deltas. And then you need to do some computation to add it up. Um, so that is one possibility. You store everything, right? So this is a traditional. And the other is you do the deltas, and then you can do the computations of your graph at different points in time. Uh, what we have proposed at one point is to do this, store the deltas and add it up. And what you can see here is um, that what we get is a complete. So this is store everything again and again and again. And obviously, we have way less rooms. Uh, and depending on, on the bucket size you use, you save quite a bit of, uh, of storage space. And depending on the bucket size and the frequency of updates, you can actually do quite quicker query answering doing this. You can also do something which MPEG does, where you say, OK, I'll store the full graph once every end so the deltas won't kill me on, uh, on updating. Right. OK. We're also working on building indices that do this natively on disk. Um, that's a whole other talk that would take a little bit too long, so I'm going to skip over that. So we're now in the past the heavy computer science -y stuff. Hello? Go. Uh, let me talk about more some more uh, uh, user interfacey things. So we did this whole study a couple of years ago with one of my beer uh, uh, save uh, PhD students. Uh, she was interested in how do people query, how would people query those triple stores, right? So with relational databases, what you can really do easily is you can do query by example, right? This is this is this is what we all do when we query, right? We go to some form and we have author and you know etc. And we enter what we can do, and then this, the database will kind of retrieve, try and retrieve this. If you have a triple store, uh, you don't have the structure to build the form in a smart way, uh, unless you know something about the structure that is very, you know, in, innate to the, to, to the data you're actually querying. So what she said is, well, let's try and see, um, so this is just a, a natural language interface that kind of has some animation that goes on in the background. She said, well, what kind of language will people want to use? And she took a whole spectrum of four different languages from uh, complete logic. Well, we didn't give people, uh, uh, you know, Sparkle, don't worry. We gave them a graphical representation of Sparkle where they could essentially drag and drop things together and, and add lines to, to show relationships. So they could put together a graph pattern graphically on one end. And on the other end, just three keywords. And in the middle ground, we had natural language. 
right? Natural language has structure. It has quite a bit of structure. It's not logic, but it has a lot of structure. There are all kinds of things that if I would say them, you guys would look at me and say, what is he saying? And then we had something called structured English. Structured English is a very limited subset of English, which is actually what this tool here is doing, Ginzang, uh, which uh, only allows you to put use certain grammatical forms and only a very limited vocabulary. And what she did is she gave this to a whole bunch of people, which we partially literally picked off the street, right? Just normal people. Uh, computer scientists were excluded from this. Uh, since we're not normal people, right? I mean, we think that SQL is actually something that managers can use, right? That's what it was developed for. Um, and uh, she ran these experiments, and she, she tried to measure two things. Uh, what do people like, and what are they good at? Well, let me tell you, they really hate structured English. Because it doesn't allow them to do things they're used to do. They really liked, and that is what surprised us in the day and age of, uh, you know, Google, Yahoo, and so forth. They really like natural language. The moment you're trying to have complex relationships, so the query here is what are the capitals of the states that border Nevada? This is not just capital states Nevada. That will get you to the capital of Nevada, right? It will not get you to the capitals of the states that border Nevada. That's actually a couple of searches away. If you have things like that, that in, have complicated relationships, people like English or whatever their language is. Um, much more than keywords, and I don't even have to go on the logic again, right? Forget about it. Um, they are good, they are actually better with this than they are with free English, because they don't put up ambiguous queries. Okay. Now to something completely different. I guess I'm in the UK, I'm allowed to say this here. Um, another thing we looked at is this kind of whole thing about cultural user interfaces. So these are, sorry, we talked about this before, market shares of uh, uh, search engines in South Korea. Um, so Naver has 77% of Google here. It's according to the New York Times in 2007. So this is Google, right? This, this is the interface we all love. Um, this is Naver. It's the interface we would never associate with a serious search engine, we being, you know, we Westerners. Um, this is Google trying to make up on uh, on Naver uh, in South Korea. You see there is some stuff jumping around now and happening, which wasn't before. Uh, let me tell you, uh, according to the numbers we heard, it didn't make a big change. It didn't make a big dent. Now, these guys also have some social networking features built into their search engine. That seems to be very important messaging, etc. And it's very difficult to to break into this. So what we build is a knowledge-based approach uh, that uses both knowledge-based elements as well as cultural anthropology, information from cultural anthropology to generate user interfaces for everybody in a very personalized fashion based on their background culture as a shortcut to overcome a cold start problem, right? In the, the best of all worlds, you could personalize everybody a, a, a web page, but you need to know something about that person first. So rather than tell you how it works, because that would take way too long, let me just show you some interfaces that we generated and we've shown with empirical tests that people are not only happier using them and prefer to use them or to actually have an efficiency gain from between 20 and 60% if they use their culturally adapted user interface. And we've done that in Switzerland, Rwanda, and Thailand, the experiment. So we haven't just done, you know, U.S. and England. We have actually taken some countries where the differences are quite vast. Um, guesses? What country is this? We've actually put, we've kept English letters, so, you know, sorry, Latin letters, so you guys won't be just looking at the writing and say, oh, this is that. What country do you think is that? What were the examples again? Um, oh no no these no no these are these are not from these examples. This is some arbitrary country we pick just to indicate this. Um, let me tell you what you should look at. Look at the color scheme. This is not your standard British color scheme, at least. It's also not your standard Swiss color scheme. Look at the big buttons here with the big icons. Um, this kind of grouping, rather than have everything in one list with sorting, right? The Google interfaces, you can do everything. Far East somewhere? It is Far East. This is South Korea. Uh, let's look at the next thing. Um, what could that be? 
let me again point out. So this is still big icons, but things are much nicer, neater, uh, nicely ordered. The color scheme is much more subdued. Most people get this one wrong. This is Japan. This is also Far East, but it just shows you the difference in in in. Uh, actually, the next one is Far East as well. It'll show you the differences between Far East. So well, this is another Far East country. Well, you almost can't get it on. This is China. And now, uh, just just look at the difference also to South Korea in this color, color scheme. Um, and last but not least. Um, well, you know where I'm from. So this is Switzerland. And it's very interesting to observe another subdued color scheme. This is very close to the US model, and I, and I assume it's very close to the UK model as well. Um, it's, it's, you know, this kind of ordered print, uh, very, you know, you, you can sort things. Um, things are very different. The types of support are different. Although, you know, this, these similarities are striking. Right. Okay. So that's one other thing we did. Uh, I'm coming to a close, I believe. The last thing, which is probably furthest away from what you guys do here, is uh, this is just kind of exemplifying it. We used massive amount of uh, ontology modeling on data mining operators. So we have modeled a big data mining ontology to pair this with a domain ontology and plan some data mining operators. Processes, right? So data most people when they think data mining is saying, oh, I'm going to apply a tree learner. And then I'm going to have the miraculous result. Fact is that's not the case. You're going to apply a tree learner, and then you're going to do lots of pre-processing and lots of post-processing to get the result you actually want. And so we have a project we're involved in, a new project, which turns out to be working extremely well, despite uh, what some other people think of EU projects, where you actually automatically plan some of these things and get results, and the results of the EU projects are part of Rapid Miner, which is the most used data mining toolkit. Uh, so if you download Rapid Miner, um, you have our planning technology. I think the planning technology is in now, but some of the uh, earlier features have been in there before. So this is kind of pairing using graph stuff and, and ontologies to actually help in other domains to achieve their goals. I'm at the end. I'm, uh, I didn't give you the NMR stuff. I don't think there's anything to do with graphs, so I'll, I'll let it go. And as things go, uh, I'm done. And I'm open for questions. And let me know if there's anything I can answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. We have time for questions. Shall I kick off? Go ahead. So I have several. Um, <laughs> I'll start with um, okay, Hexastore. Yes. So bold, you know, bold claims which, which stand up. So what next? What next? Is this just a research prototype? You know, what yes, you absolutely. It is just a research <laughs> prototype, and uh, um, so uh, we've ha actually had three iterations of implementations for a hexastores type index. We had the original one, which was underlying the original paper, and we then re-implemented the whole thing in C because we thought C is so much faster than Python and uh, the hack that we had in Python at the beginning. And we really had a faster prototype, um, which you know we're happy to share with anybody who wants to use this. Uh, but it turned out well, we didn't have any people to actually program it and push it further. Uh, because you know you get you get students, master students walk in and they say, well, uh, see uh, uh, core dumps, uh, headaches. Uh, uh, can I get Java? Do you have a project in Java? So we're actually back to a new prototype, um, which uh, is based on Python again, where we can. And the reason is Python is the quick interfacing with C, uh, rather than with Java, where you have to go through the JNI and it's deadly slow and it's a painful experience. And the reason why we want the C backends is because what we essentially build is a framework where we can plug in and plug out different kinds of indices as backends. So we can plug in and out B trees, we can plug in and out memcached, we can plug in and out. And this last thing, uh, RDF box, which is just getting its finishing touches now, we will release and let people know what all universities do is go on, go at your heart's content. If you have a problem, good luck. Uh, we may be able to commiserate over some beer, but it's not much more. 
um, because we don't just don't have the resources to uh, to support it. It's one PhD student. He's interested in this avalanche stuff and the distributed setting, and he's essentially building this to uh, to support his claim. I guess at this point we're throwing the ideas into the air and hope that people like you and Virtuoso and Allegro and I have to be careful not to be sued by a company I'm not mentioning. What's the text? Uh, are picking it up and building it into their system. And partially, I think they have adopted some of these indexing techniques that some of us have uh, used as part of it now. We're, uh, so one thing we are doing now is what happens uh, in terms of indexing when you have temporal data. And we have something in the, in the works that I'm happy to show you on a whiteboard. I don't have slides where we essentially, what if you have, you know, edges with constraints and you actually want to not retrieve the whole thing off disk and then do your constraint checking on in memory, which sometimes is faster actually because, you know, scanning on disk is, is enormously fast. So you actually have to be fast and scan. So you actually have to justify each seek for a lot of scanning. But there, we, we do believe that we have a method to trade it off and get temporal data faster. I can show it to you on a whiteboard. I can. Don't have prepared slides for that. So that's something that's research-wise, something that we're looking at. So specialized indices to do things. One thing that I'm always saying somebody should do is somebody should look at, uh, you know, reasoning and ask oneself. There are some operations you do more often with reasoning than other. For example, certain types of joins. Why not on load actually build these kind of indices? Uh, note one other reason why uh, B trees are such so painful is they are actually painful to load when they're big. I, I mean, I always thought B trees are fast, but then when you load, you know, billions of triples into a B tree, you know, you, you can go, go drink lots of coffee whilst you wait for this thing to load. So that's it. So, you know, this is, this is the problem of the research institution, I guess. Uh, we build stuff and then we throw it into the air and hope that somebody picks it up. And... Perhaps that's the right thing. Yeah? Yeah. The, um, in... In Avalanche, yes. you mentioned that there was a point where you said we've probably got an, enough of the right results now. Yes. Um, so we'll stop. That's right. So um, you're really optimizing towards getting results which are sufficient for the performing particular task. Yes. Um, but not getting complete results. Yet. So uh, is that right? We're trying to be sound. We're yeah. trying to get the first answer as quickly as possible. You know, this is kind of almost a kind of Google argument of, you know, you need to get the first 10 ones fast because that's what you're going to show you. You're not going to show you use a 50,000 answers. So don't wait for the 50,000 answers. Um, there was somebody, uh, some people at, uh, that do this in the relational world in, at CWI, the Computer Science Research Institution in Amsterdam. And they, they do this, they did this for Terra Server, I believe. Uh, Terra Server is this big kind of... Uh, uh, data set and it's something about earth and space and it's ter terabytes big and they were trying to optimize for first answers rather than what the database usually does complete answers mm -hmm. and there is a big question you know how important is completeness uh, in, in this domain you know even even in the relational database where people have been talking a lot about skyline queries and that's not first answers but it's top k answers first right um, so we've been so the, the what the planner does is the planner takes heuristics on the likelihood of certain triples being on certain machines, heuristics on the, uh, sorry, statistics on uh, the connection speeds and uh, estimates based on that on joint probabilities to plan a plan that will get the first answer first. And it will do so, right? I mean, at, at infinity, you know, if you have n servers and m possible, uh, uh, m possible, uh, sorry, triple elements, uh, sorry, uh, graph pattern elements, you know, you can have each of these be on each of the servers and each possible join possible, and you get you get a huge number of possible plants. So what it does, it just generates plants by plants by plants by plants, sends them out and gets them executed. And we need to stop the process. I mean, if you want completeness, you need to execute all of, you probably need to execute almost all of these plants, not necessarily the ones that do things in a different order for speed up reasons, but necessarily all of them that are uh, equivalent in terms of what they assume about where the triples lie. Uh, so we have some cost function that tells us how to order this. Whether the cost function is good or not, uh, we can only empirically tell you that with the five servers we used at the university, it seems to work fine. There's obviously a huge area of research about how should you construct such a search cost function. 
how do you define first in an unordered results? It's just the first one that arrives. Okay. Right. I mean, first is literally, I want an answer quickly. Mm -hmm. If you're in a world with, with ranks, this whole th that, that, that's, then you want to do a kind of a skyline query type thing. You want the top K. But we're assuming still it doesn't really matter which result as long as we deliver a result quickly. Um, that, that was what Avalanche was apt optimizing for. Could you talk a little bit about uh, updates in Hexastore? Updates in Hexastore. Uh, well, if you use the pure index with the, uh, with the uh, 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 hashes, right, uh, you, uh, you are in trouble if, you're, uh, if you have too many updates when your buckets over, overflow, right? So that is why we um, had a bachelor's student implement this. Um, this combination of a hash and a B tree, because if you don't have a lot of updates, this is quite fast. Uh, sorry, this is this is this is fast. This is order of two, right? One axis, two axis, versus all of these axes that uh, that may take some time. Um, Did you do any sort of positive testing on this? Um, on on the updates, no, uh, yes. On this, we did some quantitative testing. It's not in it's not in this talk. Yeah. Did you test on updates uh, query time whilst updates were going on at the same time? No, we did not do that. Um, so this is this is this is now now we're talking we're, now we're in bachelor thesis territory, right? Uh, give me four times four four months worth of work, um, and 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 at that point the students said forget it. So he first implemented this in a simulated this situation in Java, and then we said okay now you do it on this with. Uh, Tokyo Cabinet, Tokyo Cabinet is, okay, you know, it. Uh, it's with Tokyo Cabinet, and at the end of this, he was he, he was almost ready to uh, to kill me. Um, so no, we did not. There is a lot of testing to be done here. Uh, it's just uh, the idea of thinking of trying to get the best answers as long as you can. Uh, I mean, if this really grows, grows, grows a lot and changes a lot, I'm not sure. You know, hashes are a good idea at all. Um, if it's just updates, the B trees might work out. But if it's lots of inserts, I'm not sure you're going to be a happy camper with with B trees. What I would say might work for you if you are in a clustered situation. I don't know whether you know Ganymed by Gustavo Alonso and some other people. So, what Gustavo did is um, he is a, a, a computer science a database researcher at ETH, which is our sister institute in the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And he built a system where all queries go through a front end. And then uh, it, you have a couple of database systems in the back end, and one of them is going to answer you. So all your, when you have a transaction, when you open the transaction, you're going to talk to one of the back end servers. And once you do an update, within your transaction space, you are consistent. All the other servers will be incons inconsistent with you for a while. And then when you've finished with your transaction, it's going to update the other servers. When a new transaction comes in, it will not be, it will only be routed to an updated server. So it can be the case that two machines at the same time will give you the same the different results. Yeah. But what will not happen is if they serially are behind each other, that they will have different results. So that is something that you probably would want to employ at that point if you want the scalability. Uh, but this is not stuff I've done yet. You know, Gustavo has looked at this very extensively, uh, and you, you probably want to look at Gustavo Alonso's work for that. Um, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I understand you, you do a lot of updates. The interesting thing is that many, many of the stuff of the applications that I at least see at the Semantic Web Conference, they include very few updates. Uh, although it was a huge discussion, uh, was it the Sparkle Working Group meeting and uh, the ISWC in Washington, D.C. when I came out, what about transactions? And I think I was almost killed for just even mentioning that word. We don't need transactions. And I said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And what, 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 you know, what, what kind of four-letter words did I mention? I, acid is four letters, right? Uh, uh, I, th I think it is an important problem. It's going to bite us much more than it's going to do the relational people because the relationals at least they can uh, partition their space, and for us to partition the space is going to be, I mean us, the people who do graphs, it's going to be much more difficult. I have no answer for you there. Sorry.
would be interesting to look at, but I have no answer. Other questions? I've got another question, but yeah, yeah I'll be fine. So this is a question more about the, there's a couple of questions really about the single collect. Mm -hmm. so, um, one of them is, have you, uh, I'm not totally sure whether it, like, it runs in distributed mode or runs in a, Okay. So, so let me, I mean, you can download Signal Collect today and get it running on your machine if you Google Signal Collect. It's in, co in, it's in Google Code. We do all our development. It's all in Google Code. You can get the current shot with all its bugs. Um, it is not distributed. The version you get off the, 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 uh, the SVN or the Google Code repository is not distributed by standard. There is elements in it that will start the distribution. So we have one master student working on a distribution. I'm not 100% sure what kind of messaging architecture he's using. So the version you have now is parallel, but not distributed. So we have machines in the lab up to 24 cores in which we do our testing. So it's not distributed. There's a whole bunch of interesting things that we talked over at lunch that might happen once you have different latencies involved. And then you may want to look at, if you have those different latencies involved, what do you want to distribute how onto the, uh, to the different physical machines versus different cores. Uh, obviously, just doing that computation is another complex graph algorithm again, right? I mean, graph cuts are not simple, simple things. Uh, so lots of room for research. That's why we write proposals. And the second question, which uh, it may be about single collect, but I'm not, not uh -huh. quite sure. It, quite interested in the, in the graph approach where um, you're writing your algorithm and you can operate basically in the environment of mm -hmm. the vertex and mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. the pictures are. Um, have you any insight into whether that might be a more fruitful approach to the age old problem of um, cache invalidation? So, Quite frequently, the patterns we have is that we have a query, uh, so it's a query pattern, and we retrieve the data from it and we'll cache that and have data going on. And you'd really like, you'd like to know which things need to be validated out of the cache when a particular update happens. When a particular update happens? Yeah, or? All batch of updates happen. Oh, interesting. So uh, my complete utter guesstimate that's uh, based on sound scientific theory of intuition is uh, there must be something there there because it's a localized algorithm and if you invalidate something you will have local effects and you don't need to take local effects into account. Um, so my intuition that made me think that right. maybe I should um, well, none of our people have been doing it, and the people who tell us they use signal collect are usually machine learning people who don't update a lot of stuff other than the state of the nodes, right? And uh, the graph stays relatively uh, um, consistent during its execution. Um, my intuition it would be work. Uh, it would it would work. One thing you may want to do at is uh, there is a thesis at the University of Southampton by a guy called Alistair Owen. Uh, Al Alistair Owens, I think. Uh, he he did one uh, a thesis on uh, in memory indices for uh, um, for for triple kind triple style data, and he very intensively looked at the interaction between caching and the in-memory storage. So my intuition is, if he hasn't said something about it, uh, there must be something there that will get you on the right path. Uh, because for when you do this in-memory, so, so one of the things he's actually shown, and I almost have to say, con he has convinced me, uh, is, is why he, he has this kind of mixture between a tree and an ordered list and a hash that he uses as a structure. It's a very interesting structure. And he has essentially explained and evaluated in his thesis that the relationship between that and cache and the cache lines and the cache invalidation and why it works better that way. And it's essentially convinced me. So, you know, at least that will get you thinking right in the right direction. Uh, so you, you definitely want to look at that thesis. It's, it's a very good thesis to read just because he also argues uh, in, in, in extended length as to why Java is not a bad language to implement databases. 
And again, you know, if, if there's if you follow certain rules, uh, you know, he is he's got me convinced that there are reasons why not to do this. Which is, by the way, one of the bad things about using a very powerful language like Scala, where you know you may just add a comma to your code, but what you're doing in the background without actually knowing is you're generating 50 million objects, which is a huge overhead because an object usually takes in a, a cache line, no matter how small it is. Uh, so. You know, it's it's. If you don't know what you're doing, it's a way to very effectively shoot your foot. Yeah, but no. So the short answer is I don't have any kind of no knowledge. It's just intuition that there should be something there. There, you sh you know, you should not have to update your more than your vicinity. I mean, guess one question is how do you actually store your nodes? Are they actually objects, or do you have a more compressed way such that you avoid this cache and validation thing? Right. So so just having small numbers is usually going to you know, an object be just a few numbers is usually going to lead to objects that are smaller than a cache line. And so you're going to eval, you know, you're, you're going to underuse your cache. Uh, but I don't know, that's the answer. Right. So, uh, okay. And you have different caches, right? That's yeah, another thing, right? Yeah, you, you have the, the CPU, CPU background cache, and then you have the caches to disk. I was thinking particularly the kind of application layer. Um, mm. so we have applications that retrieve lots of data, doesn't change very often, and you want to keep it close to your application for all those reasons, but then sometimes it does change. Mm. And of course, that introduces practical challenges. If you could know the things that are going to be affected by a change in a really efficient manner, that would be very helpful. Mm. I mean, if you know something about the application, you might be able to write it in a way that you're actually very efficient with updates. And I'm sorry, I'm coming back to this. You might want to have parts of your data in this and parts of your data in, 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 in hashes. Uh, because, you, you know, this is not going to update a lot. This is going to update a lot. And then you just, you know, it might be cheaper for you to do merge joins on these things or unions on the data that's stored like this and stored like that. If you know your data.